So um, once again, I did finish this finally, this book. This is Something Deeply Hidden by Sean Carroll. This is talking about the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. And he goes from the smallest subatomic all the way to the biggest questions of the universe to black holes and the fate of the universe and the Big Bang itself. So it is very clearly written for the average public person to read. He is a very good author and I recommend it. Uh, he goes through, we had a question from two months ago uh, or two sessions ago talking about how entropy and uh, quantum mechanics relates to black holes and like that. He does hit that and talks about it and what, I'm, all, what I'll do is I'm going to synthesize that into a few more slides that will fit into what was last month's lecture. And at some point I'll just take a stop, we'll go back and I'll just kind of paint that in better than we did before. Uh, the answer is something called um, quantum ent entropy and it all comes to how entangled a little region of space and the material is, or the wave function is inside that space with the adjacent spaces and the adjacent spaces and the adjacent spaces all the way out to the edge of the universe. If it is not entangled at all, then you have very low entropy, I think that's right, and if you're highly entangled out to the edges of the universe, your wave function is spread way out, then you have very high entropy. So, and that so does... We're talking spooky action, spooky action at a distance. Yep. Okay. And how that relates to black holes, mm -hmm. why the entropy of a black hole is the surface area and not the volume, and what the connection is between entropy and the thermodynamics of a black hole. So, I will clean that up, make it visual, and distill the stuff out. But he has, he has made me an, an, what, what, an a veteran. So, a, a what? A veteran. Everett's many worlds interpretation. I, I think I, I like his okay. approach to quantum mechanics better than the Copenhagen interpretation, which mm. is you make an observation, the wave function collapses. And he points out that the the mathematics and the physics leave, oh boy, we, get, we got another one, yay. Mathematics and physics leave the discussion once you have a wave function collapse. It's just kind of hand waved in. They just say, well, this is what goes on. And then after that, you, you have a measurement. But we don't actually see that in the mathematics. We don't see that in the physics. It, it is made up. So he says the simplest interpretation is Everett's many worlds, that Good. when a decision is made, um, then both worlds are e equally exist and go forward from there. Um, he does make some interesting clarifications, and I've e even been guilty of saying this incorrectly. Uh, it's a quantum mechanical decision that splits the universes, and not just me deciding to do this or do that or flip a, a big macro sized coin. Those are not quantum mechanical events. So those are not splitting universes and every decision like do I have chocolate ice cream or vanilla ice cream is not making new universes. Um, but there is, and I knew this from before, but he references this. There's an app called Universes, Universe Splitter. <laughs> It's about, I think it's like five bucks. And you get to write in your two choices that you want to make, make the universe split over. And when you push but, the button, it goes through the, the request goes to the internet to Geneva to a uh, photon splitting device. And it emits a photon and the photon either goes one way or the other way and it reports the results back to the app and, and you get it. So we, and so you actually can make your decision uh, entangled with a quantum mechanical process. So that you don't know if you want chocolate or Okay, so. The quantum mechanical way of tossing lots. Tossing lots. Okay, so here, here we go. Chocolate and vanilla. Here, let's split the, it doesn't cost anything to split the universe, which is really important. 
So there it goes, input valid, internet con contacted, awesome. Geneva's online, device ready, photon emitted. Oh, there it goes, boom. Yeah. It just says, your universe is just split, you're in the universe in which you should vanilla. <laughs> okay. So there we go. We just, we just did it. Do you feel different? Oh my goodness sakes. This is your taxpayer money and we're Or at least your Nobel Prize money. That would be a better government than what we have. Although I like Trump. That's right. I like Trump, but our government is still in bad shape. Yes. All right. So any questions about old quantum stuff that most of you weren't around for? <laughs> I like the prologue on this. It says, don't be afraid. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he does talk about how quantum mechanics is not scary and that anybody can understand it and here's why and goes into it. So he, he's really good. So, All right, so what we're going to talk about is life and livability. I guess you could also label this as real estate. So it's all about location, location, location. Um, so, what is life? Who wants to define life real quick? You guys are all experts. I mean, you're living. It's like art. It's like art. You know when you see it. Exactly. Very good. <laughs> Another political reference. Anybody want to define life? It's a gift of God. A gift of God. How do you get, because when somebody is alive and then they're dead, mm -hmm. there's no difference in the body. All of a sudden, there's yeah. something else that's not there, and you can't even measure it with a quantum mechanical scale. Mm -hmm. have stories of weighing people, and then when they die, seeing the scale change from the 1800s were not accurate. So, <laughs> not, not, not been replicated. So. Hey, but that was a belief for a while that they. I, what was it? It was the weight of a spirit. Right, eight, or eight ounces or something like that. Mm -hmm. All right, so pop quiz. Are animals alive? Uh, yes. Okay, all right. Uh, plants? Yes. Yeah. Uh, bacteria? Yes. Yeah. Oh, viruses? Yes. Yeah. Viruses? Oh. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Uh, prions? Wait a minute. These are mis proteins. proteins. Yeah, that's the cause of mad cow's disease. Protein, no. I mean, they're pretty complex, uh, specialized proteins that replicate, and they use material very similar to viruses. It's an organic compound, right? So it's an organic compound, but it, it is much simpler than a virus, much, much smaller. Yeah. So these are, these are questions. These are good questions. All right. So, some of the approaches that scientists, and we're going to talk a lot about SETI folks, search for extraterrestrial intelligence folks, um, were very fringy in the early days. Frank Drake, as a name will have come up a lot, uh, who really kind of helped push it as a, a, a valid scientific direction of thought with very careful parameters that you, you map out why you're investigating things one way or another. And we'll look at things like extreme, extremophiles and, and, and things like that. But they decide we do need to talk about what's alive because if we're going to go to planet around Alpha Centauri and we find something growing on a rock or at least sitting on a rock that could be growing, do we call it alive or not? So homeostasis, something that can regulate its own chemistry and temperature. Okay, well, going back, uh, prions can't, viruses can't, bacteria does. Uh, they can, yeah, it's own chemistry. It's own chemistry. Yeah, temperature is yeah, just a possible. Chemistry. Yeah, chemistry, yeah. right. Organization, uh, composed of one or more cells. Viruses have a cell type in nature, a little capsule. It's not a full out cell. Uh, prions or prions don't. Um, a metabolism that convert chemicals into energy. Going, that's, uh, yeah, that's, yeah, bacteria do. Viruses don't. They require another cell as uh, material to do that, and definitely prions don't. Interesting. And prions don't. Then. Right. And growth. They increase in size or make multiple parts. 
Viruses do that, but again, with, by conscripting the mechanism of something else, prions do the same as viruses. So you can see prions and viruses are kind of in a, a shady area. Um, they're definitely part of the living world, but they, they have issues. Well, if you consider the complexity of the proteins that are making life up, you could kind of see how Mis the way you put it, mm -hmm. gave me a different philosophy, misfolded proteins. Mm -hmm. They're right there. I yeah. mean, if you think about the proteins we have, they're incredibly complex. Right. So you're going to have some that are doing funny things, and then you'll end up with viruses and mad cow disease. Yeah, you don't find those proteins just out in the wild. They don't just come about. They, they need to have, they've come about inside of living organisms mm -hmm. through errors and, and things like people eating people and cows eating cows um, uh, seems to be one of the, the greatest generators of these and they can get passed on uh, through consumption. But in their environment, that's exactly what right. they, that's right. That's in mm -hmm. the cell or in right. the body in the life. Yep. Another would be response to stimuli. It can respond to light, moisture, sounds, etc. Bacteria don't really do that well, but they, they can, they have cilia and they can move uh, in, in a gradient of temperature or uh, towards more favorable conditions. So there is some, something there. Viruses don't, they require a passive um, passage. Uh, reproduction, okay, can create exact or similar copies. That, that works all the way down to the prion level. So prions definitely uh, do that as well. So going back to the quiz again, animals definitely, plants, yes, bacteria, probably, yeah, definitely, enough of those things. Viruses, uh, for me, viruses are really on the fence in my mind. Maybe you are more com comfortable one way or the other, but um, they're more of a uh, biochemical leech. reproduction the definition is a really good one for life. So for me, I'm kind of comfortable saying viruses and and the other ones are, are, are a category of life. Mm -hmm. well, and they do mutate to adapt. Yeah. They change. They change. Exactly. They change. So. Yep. They definitely have the ability to do that. Yep. Okay. What about fire? Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> about fire? <laughs> yeah. It it reproduces. All yeah. It adapts. <laughs> yeah. Follow, it follows it gradients. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But that most people would say, no, fire doesn't work. It seems alive. I, I think there's, there's, there's a, almost a personification of fire that can occur, especially when you're in a heightened fear condition, you're fighting it, for instance. Is fire an entity or is it a process? Right. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's a chemical. It's a chemical. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I think it's a process. So here's Miller, uh, looking very classically nerdy. Uh, we got the, got the white shirt and tie. And just well, he doesn't have the, pen doesn't have the yeah. The, his wife didn't give him a shirt with a pocket that day. Um, so I was looking at the nature of life. Because this is the double helix. This is the hard drive. Uh, in our bodies that uh, stores all the information of how we get built and repaired and grow and change. Um, so he, he approached it with this definition, it's a chemical process. We have DNA as an information storage duplication process. You have proteins, enzymes, RNA, amino acids, uh, DNA and common sugars, and these communicate uh, information through the, the body and read the hard drive and build the components of the body and everything else like that. What's interesting is on the earth, proteins, enzymes, RNA, and amino acids are all left-handed. So they have, uh, if you go the direction they spiral, then your hand curves like this. So the the building of that goes in that direction. Right-handed are the uh, DNA and sugars. Huh. And that is universally uh, the way the Earth works. So there, the one that pictured right there, is that right-handed or left-handed? That's. It changes in the perspective. It's right left, handed. yeah, left hand, uh, right-handed, sorry. Yeah, because you're going like this. Okay. You can see the direction that the blue goes. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Now I'm starting to see yeah. the issue. Okay. So if you go to a museum now and you see a model, you can check to see if they follow the instructions correctly. <laughs> um, Right, it works in, in both directions, yeah. Uh oh, my DNA is upside down. Uh, <laughs> I'll be back. Just stand on my head. Um, so, this is how it got selected on Earth. Uh, the amino acids and, and um, elements that are you know, slightly more complex carbon based molecules coming in on meteorites come in pretty much 50-50. So in deep space, the way these chemicals are made by ultraviolet light, interacting with carbon, carbonaceous compounds and, and water and things, even in small amounts over time, you'll get amino acids and, and uh, things forming out there. They come raining in uh, about 50-50. So uh, down here though, the ones that a left-handed, right-handed work. There are cases in the biosphere where you have amino acids, for instance, that are right-handed. These are typically very poisonous compounds uh, created by, um, say, fungus, uh, deadly mushrooms. Um, I think there's a tree frog, poisonous tree frog. The, the, some of the material that they create, um, uh, I think, also in the venom of some snakes. You have the opposite handedness. So that's something not ex um, explored often in say Star Trek where they go zipping off to a foreign world, they hop off and go, it's a paradise and they grab a piece of alien fruit and eat it. Well, if, it had, if that planet had the opposite handedness, then, well, it, it, at best, it does nothing to them. It's like eating styrofoam would just would go through them. At worst, it would be the most deadly toxin and actually as they put it in their mouth it would start to unwind the cell structures in their mouth and so it would act like a, a, a bioreactive acid and so their jaw would fall off and their esophagus melt. Yeah, pretty awful. So, um, just people don't think about that and put that in sci-fi. It'll be there eventually. Um, so the question is, he wanted to know where, where do we get the origin of life? Um, spoiler alert, we still don't know the point in history where we go from abiotic to biotic. Um, but his thought uh, experiment was to, you know, back in the 50s, to try to create what we thought at that time was the early atmosphere of the earth, add electricity from lightning, and kind of reproduce those um, um, conditions in this little setup here. Do I have a bigger picture of it? Yes, I do, thank you. Uh, we got heat. Uh, one thing you need is a gradient of energy. You need more energy in one place than another. And we see that um, from the equator to the poles. You have weather itself is being driven by this uh, lack of equilibrium. Uh, we have daytime, the sun beats down on the surface of the earth, so you got warming there, but down Below, you have uh, cooler conditions in the soil, going much deeper, it gets hotter again because of the interior heat of the earth. So we have gradients of energy all over the place. Um, and then you zap it with electricity to uh, allow rare molecular combinations to occur. You let things cool back down again, and you can pull off sample material and, you know, like that. So uh, he did get simple amino acids to form. Now looking at meteors, we see simple amino acids raining down on us all the time. So they do form by themselves all over the place. It's a natural chemi chemical reaction in the, in the world. Now he did many of these experiments with varying conditions. And when he was done with it, they all stored, I don't remember where this is, is it Stanford or Harvard? I, I just don't recall. Um, but they stored these glass jars and just let them sit. And they slowly continued to change over time. And people more recently, in the last decade or so, went back and took little samples out and found even more interesting things that started happening in there, like uh, 50 years later. So um, I'm sure it smells bad. <laughs> So looking at the history of life on Earth, uh, going back from present 
uh, where the first humans are really so teeny sliver, it's right inside that line, it's so tiny, going all the way back to the origin of the Earth 4.5 billion years ago. Um, we have the Earth cooling for enough for the crust to solidify. Someplace in here, uh, you get the uh, lunar forming impact that reliquified whatever was starting to cool down on, on Earth um, by our favorite theory of lunar formation. But you can see pretty quickly about uh, 3.9 or so billion years back, we see the origin of life already. And this is the point where the handedness of sugars and amino acids got selected for. So you know, everybody gets really excited about bigger features uh, showing up and being passed forward in, in the tree of life, but really the very first selection was that handedness of what works um, in, in just sugars and amino acids. Uh, the oldest evidence we see is here. The oldest um, single-celled fossils are here. Well, I think we have pictures of them. So here's, uh, that's too early. Here's the earliest uh, known in the center of Australia. So the oldest continent uh, material, continents recycle, as we saw in the earlier parts of the class. You have subduction zones where the old crust goes under and gets recycled and pumped back out at, at mostly mid-oceanic ridges. Um, but you can see what were large bacterial mats. These are the ancestors of the gunk you get growing in your sink and in your drains at home. Uh, so use Drano every now and then, it's a good idea. Um, but uh, the question is, how do we go from abiotic material to um, stuff with cells and DNA and information transferring molecules and like that. Some of the thoughts are you might have had naturally occurring fatty bubbles, kind of early version of soap. Uh, you get natural stuff like this forming in streams and, and like that today. Could also be gaps inside of uh, fairly well packed mud. Uh, could be in pores around oceanic vents, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, but we don't know. We have no evidence of that transition point. Uh, here is a close up of one of these little prokaryotes down in here. You can see it's got a little possibly segmented a few cells there. Kind of crazy. How do we know it was that old? Did you uh, do carbon dating on it? Is that how they know it was No, carbon dating only works for like the back past 50,000 years or so on, on larger stuff. What you do is you, you build the geologic model of the region based on radioactive elements. Oh, okay. So radioactive elements, some of them have half-lives of billions of years. When a crystal is formed in cooling magma, say, then the crystals that form that incorporate these radioactive molecules like uranium or thorium or rubidium, um, which all have different uh, things, will only form the crystal, uh, letting those Lego pieces of the correct atoms into the crystal. Um, and then it cools and it stays that way. Time passes and the radioactive elements break down to their uh, sometimes gas, part gas, part solid. But when you come across what is a uranium, um, I'll make it something like uranium sulfate uh, crystal, then you find lead in there. Well, it would never have built a crystal with this macro shape using lead. Lead is a wrong, uh, uh, wrong element for building that shape and like that, right. So then you just smash it all up and see how much lead is there. And using the equation for the half-life, pretty simple equation, um, you can get the date. So you sample the region, you start building a, a larger scale model. Uh, usually these things are sedimentary, and so you'll find small crystals in there, but you get the age of the crystals here. You don't get the age of when the sediment was created. So that, that does not directly allow you to take care of a sedimentary region. So you have to build the, the idea of the aging around the, of the whole area. Does that help? Good. A little bit. I mean, okay. it's the scientific conjecture 
but mm -hmm. it, it's what people want to find. Yeah. I mean, it's what we're looking for. Yeah. Isn't it the same as the very, very deep diamond mine or the mine that they went into 10, mm -hmm. 12,000 feet underground? Mm -hmm. I think I've heard of that. Was that diamond light? Or was it? They released. They released whatever was down there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 or was that an uh, Antarctic ice core? No, this was in a mine. Diamond light. Okay. I, I don't think I'm familiar with that. Oh, interesting. Well, ten. How many? How deep? Thousands of feet. I don't know. Ten thousand. Well, don't we go by, don't we, don't we think that the layers are the years? We're going back in time. 10,000 feet, 10, feet would be 16 billion years old. <laughs> wow. Well, I mean, we, guys, you yeah. know, 65 million years with just the darn dinosaurs, and they're like a few feet, right? Well, you, you, get, you get surface areas that are eroded away, too. Eroded away so you got sure. stuff buried and then re-expose, bringing them back up to the surface. Okay. Yep. Um, so, uh, here is a, where the world literally changed. At uh, 2.5 billion years, uh, these cyanobacteria uh, started to create oxygen as a waste product. So, early on, these old guys didn't. They just uh, um, worked with what was around. But these guys started to pump out oxygen and they have, they and the subsequent life that followed have permanently changed the chemistry of the entire uh, planet. And we're, we're talking dramatic, including with oxygen in the atmosphere, the type of crystals that can form are now completely different. So it is, yeah, yeah, oxygen, oxygen very reactive. Um, so, which are, which of the following are testable hypotheses about the origin of life on Earth? Testable. Extraterrestrial aliens brought it. Can we test that? that? Not testable. We can't test that, no. Unless they come here and say, sorry folks, we did it. Fake news. Um, me came with meteors from other planets. That is not testable. Not testable until unless... Until we find one. Until we find something. Life. Now last night when I did my little news update, talked about Mars. And Mars having a, uh, you know, a oxygen and methane spring and summer release in the hemisphere that isn't yet explainable by geochemistry alone. The easiest thing to go to is if there's microbial life in the crust that when it warms up, it eats, takes a little a meal, gets a little water and like that. But we don't know. <laughs> so we don't say we have that. We just say, all right, put that aside, keep working on the non-life reasons. Look for what else could cause it. But the thinking is that Mars is smaller. It cooled faster. It's further from the sun. It cooled faster. It got its act together, had lots of flowing water on the surface for a long time in its early history. And if it really takes, let's see if we go back to this, such a little pop of time between a planet cooling and life to start, well, that's, at least bacterial stuff is going to be everywhere. Yeah. And it'll be in the solar system, it'll be, and we're going to talk about all the candidates in the solar system probably next month. But the whole idea is Mars might have gotten its act together. We know we have had actual meteors from Mars get here, it was the ALH, I don't remember the number, 00156 or something. It, they go, the way they do is they go to Antarctica in, in the summer and throw grad students out on the ice and say, go pick up rocks. If you're standing on miles of ice and there's a rock there, the rock came from space. And so uh, they pick up, they're usually black, really easy to see. So you've got, um, you've got meteors, you've got, uh, moon rocks and you've got Martian rocks that have all been recovered. Just How can we tell the difference between meteor rocks and Martian rocks? Different chemistry. Martian rocks have a much higher iron content and very specific uh, percolate uh, chemical signatures. Based and, on, on 
based on what we normally see fall yeah. on the Earth. Right. Okay. We, yeah. And we we know what, what meteors we now we've done lunar returns we've done space based me meteoric re returns and we've studied Mars in in place with uh, spectroscopy and and samples and picked up rocks and baked them and we've done we've done experiments in all three environments and so now we know so and, and the the air the atmosphere trapped inside of this one Martian rock is got the same high carbon dioxide mixture that is found on Mars so yeah and that's that one we'll talk about we'll get to it that one had the controversial uh, discovery of fossilized bacteria in it and NASA actually announced it um, and then the scientific community hopped all over them like uh, angry jackrabbits and, and said, you don't have a case here. One of the main arguments, and we'll, I'm just spoiler alert again, is that these look like bacteria. They look like little bacterial shaped fossil things, mineralized, um, but it'd be the same as having a full grown human with functioning organs and brain and everything being about that tall. So it's hard to explain how you can miniaturize, even in a single-celled organism, the complex biochemistry needed. So uh, pretty much that's been put aside. Like we don't really know what, what we have there. So the, the threshold of finding life elsewhere is very rigorous, <laughs> and we we don't have that yet. Um, so it is a possibility, and it just requires um, a lot more study and, and finding stuff elsewhere. Uh, chemicals from primordial soup combine to make life. Well, it's kind of testable. I mean, he did it, Miller did it with his amino acids, but he didn't get anything more complex. But he also didn't have half a billion years to work on it. So, well, but what are the odds of even a simple protein? I mean, a, a single protein it's like the odds were one in, one times 10 to 140th or something. I actually have. Crazy, let me do a, crazy, let me, ridiculous odds. Yeah, let me do a spoiler alert, though. <laughs> Not a spoiler alert. Uh, a, a shameless plug. Uh, I just finished a book on reality, and I'm actually in December, I think it's Saturday the 21st, I'll be up at Estes Park Observatory um, with this. Oh, there's my universal. Thing. Let me look at the date. I'm gonna drink beer with us at this winter solstice. I know. I'll, I'll, I'll try to do it in the afternoon. Yeah, it's the 21st, and it's, um, it's yeah, so I'll have the open house night on Friday, class in the morning, and then I'll drive up there at 7 o'clock. And reality um, is the book and the talk, and it's how science and theology can never get along, how science and theology can get along. And I have a whole section on um, the theological approach to reality. And I get deeply into the odds of the chemi chemical uh, combinations of things and randomness. In fact, randomness plays a big part of my book and my talk. And uh, when you do just raw numbers of random combinations of atoms to make amino acids, you do get ridiculously bad odds. But when you look at how like a carbon uh, atom l is ready to grab onto other atoms in special ways. You find what they, what they do is they create a, an abstract concept called a phase space. So I'm jumping outside of here, just kind of, it's related to this. So like my phase space right now, are all the things that I can do so I could jump up and down, I could do it on one leg, I could run right and left and forward and back. And so I have a lot of random things I could do right now. I could go through the door, I could start singing a song, I could lay down and go to sleep. There's a lot of options. Of freedom. All right, those are my degrees of freedom, or phase space. Right, but I can't fly, I can't, can't right. Superman up through the roof, um, I can't, catch fire, or teleport, uh, pull a million dollars out of my pocket. There's a lot of things that randomly could be ascribed to possible actions 
but they're not possible to me. They're not in, the, uh, in my phase space. In fact, it's even more limited than that. I can't in, that fast be outside the door. It takes a little longer. So the only thing that's available to me in the, in the random things I could do right now are the adjacent possible in my phase space. Well, that really cuts down on all the possible things you can imagine in your mind that I could do in the next second. And the same thing is true with atoms making molecules in a primordial soup or Miller's experiment. The reason we get amino acids forming so readily is that the adjacent possible phase space option for atoms that are all together like nitrogen, hydrogen, carbon, sulfur are really limited and create order. Now, once you get the amino acid uh, formed, you have a new phase space of um, adjacent possible. Again, greatly limiting the tremendous number of other things you can imagine happening with a uranium atom sticking in there or lead or anything else. So in the next iteration of time, taking the building blocks available, the system will progress in, into the adjacent possible. And so when you do that, then you find out that, yeah, it is very easy to get structure out of randomness. In fact, randomness is highly structured. It's shot through on all scales from the universe itself down into all the atoms making a table um, around us. But I further hypothesize, and this is getting to the theological side of it, that we have randomness blindness randomness, I'm getting not way off of this, but cognitively we're disturbed by randomness. It, and in the most dire way of looking at it, we don't know when we're going to die. And so it's mortally important to us to not go into that realm or we just get really depressed. Like, I'm going to die someday, I'm going to die someday. Oh my gosh, how's it going to happen? Is it going to hurt? Yeah. So, so we, we stay away from that topic. But we also stay away from all the other weird random things happening. Randomness is hard to deal with. You have to make a decision. You have to uh, deal with random things that happen. But yet, car accidents happen. House fires happen. Kids throwing up on the airplane next to you happen. Randomness is, is all around us. And we, we are adaptable, but we try to see the organization and structure. That's what our brains really fight for. We try to see the, the tiger through the grass. We try to see the pattern of lottery numbers that, we, that will help us win. Whatever we're trying to do, we are looking to make structure rather than focus into the random. And so our in intuition of random processes is really wrong. And I go into some examples of that. You've heard of the Monty Hall uh, problem. It just It's a quick illustration to how our intuitive feeling of randomness doesn't work, and there's a whole game show that ran for decades based on it. Uh, so Monty Hall would ha have audience members stand up, and they'd have three doors, and he said, behind one of the doors is a fantastic prize, and I want you to pick one. Right, so they pick a door, and then he said, all right, I am going to take away, so before we open this one that you picked, I'm going to take away this door. All right, now, do you want to stick with your original choice or do you want to switch? And intuitively, we feel that the odds are one third, one third, one third. So it doesn't matter if I change doors or not now that he's taken the door away. But that's not true in the mathematics of the problem. What he's done is when he took that away, he turned the two doors into 50-50. But when you selected that door, it was only 30% chance. So the other door is now 50% chance of being the right one with the prize. It is always better to switch to the one that doesn't. But that doesn't work inside our in intuition. So, and you can run a simulation on that. You can do it on a computer and just play the game like that. No, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense to me. If you, if, right. So, switch. <laughs> so, so if, you know, if you know that there's a really good prize, do they tell you what the prize is? Yeah, no, they just say it. So, one, so let's say it's a million dollars. Yeah. Right? yeah. Or, or a really good prize. You pick door A, yeah. and behind door A, there is no million dollars, right? There's a prize, but it's not a million dollars. 
Okay. Yeah. Well, it could be too. So, so, then, so assuming that you don't get the million dollars on your first guess, that means behind door B or door C, there's a million dollars. Right. So if he takes one of those doors away, which is now definitely a dud. You're forced into picking the door that he didn't take away, but if you take that door, the odds of getting a million dollars are 50 50 because of the other two doors. He added information into the system. Yeah. And he, and going back to the earlier thing, he closed down the adjacent possibles. And so he, he steered you towards, if you take it, <laughs> a better adjacent possible. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah, you might have landed on the million dollar door, and then no, you do lose. <laughs> so, anyways, that's that. That's the stuff that I get into in reality, and, and the book will be out late next year. And I got publisher. The editor is working on it right now. It's exciting. Um, but I get into um, theology pretty heavily in that too. So, all right. So, chemicals from another soup. That, that was I said more than I thought we would on that. Um, and life appearing spontaneously. Is that hypothesis? No, I mean, you have to show the process, so. Oh, none of the above. All right, that's, we, we got that slide well. All right, so what is needed for this to occur? Things to be just right on the biggest scale. So here's a, a, a very simple but useful first look at um, how, how one might get life. Uh, going to the adjacent possibles, you need adjacent possibles that aren't including just lakes of magma. As far as we know, temperatures that high are too disruptive to complex uh, chemistry to organize. So this is these are the Goldilocks zones because, and I don't have that comic. Do you have a comic? Any place? No. Okay. So there's a very. I got, I'm going to add the comic to this. There's there's a. In here is, is, is too hot. Your, your temperatures on any planet that close to the is too hot. Right. The temperatures are so high that it's extraordinarily unlikely that you can have any complex organisms or chemistry go on. Out here, you're too cold, you're too far away. Now we're gonna talk about how that's not that's oversimplifying it. This part is too cold. Right. But in the green section here, you have the temperatures right on planets in there that at least if you're going to have carbon and water-based life, you've got water possible in all three phases, solid, liquid, gas, which we have here. And so this is the Goldilocks zone. So the comic uh, doesn't say anything, but it has a picture of the solar system. It's got the Goldilocks zone in green like that. And it says in here, no bears out here, no bears in here, high chance of bears. So, <laughs> and I, I kind of got it on that level, but I didn't get the Goldilocks connection until like a month later and I got another laugh out of it. So, <laughs> so there are a high probability of bears in this area here. Um, so the Goldilocks zone on a really hot star, like an F type star would be large and more distant, a very dim M class star. We have a tiny little hot dead zone in here and a small little life zone and everything's pretty cold around it. Um, <clears throat> so as you go from very dim, cool reddish stars up to the O and B stars, the habitable zone uh, heads out. You have a problem in some of these in a lot of the M class stars have, are very reactive in solar flares and coronal um, mass ejections. And so even though the temperature might be right, if you keep nuking your planets with uh, material off the star, it's, it's going to be hard for things to hold together. Um, and similarly, when you're up at the very, very top end here, you've got the problem of just a colossal amount of ultraviolet radiation being put out by the star. You know, these are all things we talked about in the earlier parts of the course. Um, and so even though the temperature may be ideal here, the peak radiation, the, um, the Wien's law, 
peak is up into pretty pretty deadly area. So here's Mars just on the outside, Venus on the inside, and us in the middle. We're going to talk about the, the importance of the local environment on the bodies, because even the moons out here, as we are going to talk about, can have these conditions right. It's just they're not relying on the sun as the disequilibrium temperature source. And here, with our atmosphere, uh, our equilibrium temperature with the sun is right about freezing. We, we should be a snowball. But the atmosphere, the greenhouse effect of water vapor, carbon dioxide, and like that, actually keep us about 25 degrees warmer than that, and kind of, kind of comfortable in the 50s on average. So when the, so the, the universe was younger, the sun was probably had more material, it was a larger star, right? It had more energy? Actually, it's the reverse, it was cooler. Yeah, the early sun was a lot cooler, which has led to serious headaches with studying Mars's early life, um, the life of the planet, uh, because we do see evidence of a lot of water flowing, there, so it had to be warm enough for that. But yet the sun is a lot cooler, so it's. So if we wait a while, and the sun gets hotter, then eventually Mars will be habitable again. Correct. Awesome. Yeah. You know, have to do something about atmospheric pressure because you don't want to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger with the eyes bugging out. And going, <laughs> so, so yeah, it's just a side picture here of, of the the hot zone, the nice zone, and the cooler zone uh, out on the edges. Uh, the Goldilocks model, though, is is too simple. Uh, higher pressures, atmospheric chemistry, the reflectivity of the planet itself can. Um, change the zones of this warming and cooling. Uh, we, we do see evidence. Now, one, of the, one of the problems we had with climate models as we try to put together the early climate models is that you had to tweak the model carefully or it would crash into the snowball earth solution. And basically the snowball earth is you get, you get some snow at the poles and the snow uh, lays on the ground. It stays cold enough for the snow on the ground. Snow, fresh snow, reflects 90, 95% of the sunlight that hits it. So I go straight back into space rather than warming the earth, warming the atmosphere. And so that cools the poles, so you get a little more cold air, which lets snow fall a little bit closer to the equator, which is more reflectivity, which is more cooling, which lets more snow fall, and this cycles all, all through until the, the planet freezes completely over. And then you'd have to hit the stop button on your computer and start over again and tweak things so your, your, your weather forecasting model wouldn't become glacier for the rest of time. Uh, but we do see now evidence that the Earth has dipped into a snowball solution a few times um, itself and got itself out of it. Uh, we do see changes over time as orbits change. Uh, early ideas of a solar system where mm, the planets are kind of where they are. But we now see evidence that Jupiter and Saturn has done, have done a pretty complex dance and have moved around in the solar system significantly and have probably shifted everything else uh, accordingly. And so we, we looked at that in the earlier part of the, part of the course. So, sorry, this is a this is from my meeting in, in um, uh, Virginia, NASA, last week. I can't believe that was only a week ago. And uh, we had a person in charge of planetary uh, science up talking. And he was talking about how the Goldilocks zone model is, um, really needs to be updated in, in education, because uh, he was speaking to all us educators. And so here's time. This is the age of the sun. So here's early on when the sun formed, it was pretty, um, pretty cool, and the sun got hotter, and now we're down to present day here, and then going on into the future as the sun uh, gets hotter and hotter again. So what you see with Mercury, and then looking at the, how the orbits have moved around, you can trace how close to habitable 
the planets were over time. So early on, uh, you had planets themselves were pretty hot, had to cool down, and the sun was coming online. And the sun gets hotter and hotter, um, but the planets cool a little faster, so Mercury kind of started heading towards habitable, but never got there. It always stayed too hot, too close to the sun, and now the sun is heating further, so you can see it's just getting worse for Mercury. For Venus over time, early on it too was way too hot, and then it cooled down for a while, enough to probably have oceans and continents and everything like that, very much like Earth, and spent some time in the habitable zone, and then the sun continued to heat up, and it passed into its runaway greenhouse with a much thicker carbon dioxide base, I mean, tremendously thick. Um, and you're up into the, the hellish hot Venus of today, and it's just going to get worse. Earth, too hot early on, moon formed in here, and then it was in the habitable zone for a very long time, and it actually got too cold a few times. You see it actually just about passing into the snowball solution a couple of times, and maybe never making it out. We'll see, sun warmed up some more, but the sun did, and we are now firmly, happily in the, um, in, the, in the comfort zone, but the sun's future is warmer and warmer. We're going to continue to warm up no matter what until we pass into the death zone as well. Mars is definitely habitable for a long time early on. We see evidence of oceans, uh, big canyons, long-formed erosional features, uh, rainfall for long periods of time on the upslope mountains, and then it got just too cold, and everything froze uh, with very little magnetic field, water, and a lot of the atmosphere lost. And it is cold and mostly dead now. But eventually, as the sun warms up, it will get back again to warmer, and it'll last warmer uh, a little longer than us. So we might want to uh, move people in a billion years or so over to Mars. And, <laughs> and so now. A person in, um, in Arizona registered the planet Mars in the uh, geologic record and made a, a mineral claim on Mars because uh, there's a lot of mining in Arizona. And so he registered all of Mars and then sold certificates to people to buy plots of land. So I own a couple acres um, that I bought in high school. Uh, near the equator, about right there. So you can come visit. <laughs> I, I, I plan to put a summer home there in a billion years. So uh, I, it's going to be expensive to survey that QA. Yeah, yeah, and I, yeah, I've misplaced the certificate someplace in all these. <laughs> so, anyway, so what is habitable and what isn't over time is more complex. And we're going to see as we go through the solar system that. Uh, uh, it's more complex elsewhere. In the galaxy, you can see uh, the same concept of habitability in uh, the availability of material and the density of stars and also the probability of more violent events occurring to a solar system or just higher amounts of radiation from the central region of the galaxy. So there's a simple idea that there's some belt inside of a galaxy in which conditions are better, where the adjacent possible is more likely to come together to allow planets with um, life to, to come about and not be uh, continually disrupted by uh, other events occurring. So if it works on Earth, what are the ingredients needed for life? You need a liquid and a solvent. Possibly it's helpful to have it in three phases. Um, our solvent of choice is water. And what's really interesting about water as, uh, as a solvent is it is a polar molecule. So you have a little more of a negative charge on one side uh, where the oxygen is and a little more positive charge on the hydrogen side of the two hydrogen side of the molecule. And so it's, it's a pretty good solvent. I mean, we use just plain water to clean a lot of stuff around the house and in the kitchen sink and like that. It's only when you get the fatty, greasy stuff that we have to pull out soap, but it, it 
does a great job cleaning stuff. When you solidify it, it expands. It's one, I think only ammonia solids also expand, but not only to like 1% or so the amount that water expands when it freezes. And uh, that's very helpful because that keeps the solid form up on the top of lakes and on the top of the ocean. If ice did what almost every other material that we know that goes from a liquid to a solid does just contract further, uh, it would sink to the bottom of the ocean. And then you can't heat it and melt it again. And next time ice forms, it sinks and it sinks and it sinks until you get a runaway buildup of ice from the ocean bottom up. And then again, snowball planet, except for maybe near the equator, uh, you have a little cold, briny mess on the surface of a whole bunch of ice. So pretty special um, condition of water and why we like uh, looking for water out in the universe if we're going to try to find life. In fact, I think if we didn't have the amount of water that we do, uh, we would no longer be in the habitable zone, would we? Correct. Water, we, we went to the restroom at that moment, but that is an important greenhouse effect, right? Okay, yeah, I was... Yeah. Uh, when you're, <laughs> when you're uh, in Arizona, as I'm going there for Thanksgiving, uh, even in the summer, 110. Uh, easily in the daytime, but at night you can drop down to 50. Mm -hmm. And what usually uh, kills uh, people out in their flip-flops and tank tops and shorts when they get lost or the car breaks down in the middle of nowhere is hypothermia. Because, well, they know to stay out of the sun, they feel the sunburn coming on, uh, they have enough water in the body for a day or two, but at nighttime, they have no way to keep warm. They don't know how to start a fire because their phone doesn't have an app for that. <laughs> and they, they uh, just get chilled and, 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 and die of cold. There's a billion dollar idea. <laughs> <laughs> Put an app in it. A lighter? <laughs> yeah. That's right, you can stop. Stab the battery. Yeah. You got one shot at it, but get that lithium. That's a good idea. That's, that's practical thinking right there. But then I can't Instagram my my oh, yeah. car in the middle of nowhere. Well, if you're dead, you can't Instagram them either. Oh, well, that's taking forethought. Uh, we also need energy, a temperature gradient. It doesn't just have to be the star. It can be the interior of a planet cooling from its formation. It could also be the interior of a planet heated by tidal forces, and we'll explore all these. And you need nutrients, some chemicals that are useful for um, biological chemistry. They're also not in equilibrium. There's more of it over to the left and less of it to the right. It wants to flow, diffuse in that direction, and that, that's important. So we'll talk about Earth after the break. Take about a 10-minute break to rest your brain, and we'll get back to stuff. Is any of this making you hungry? Or, or, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of bio-nutrient talk.
test, test. They're getting around the balloons. So vertical line is something, but it's constant speed. Um, yeah, and there is a signal line too, although I don't see the signal line very, very well. You get an extra show. Yeah, all the little bright spots basically are meteors? Are meteors. Okay. Everything. And it keeps going. Those little ones are probably about the same size. Yeah. Tiny, tiny little ones. And you're the, we're the only ones knowing that they're happening. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No one else can see them. I doubt anybody else is looking at meteors on a. And we can throw maybe a few. Of there's, there's an app for that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we can turn the speaker on and you can hear them. Ping, ping. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was really fun. Okay, let's go. All right. So again, <laughs> water is our favorite solvent here. The sun is our favorite source of energy here. We do get a little uh, disequilibrium of temperature. We're losing it here. Uh, I just shook it. I think it'll, it'll make it through. Hydrothermal vents. Uh, hot springs, things like that, uh, do create a local source of energy. And our favorite nutrients are carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, hydrogen, and sulfur. We like temperatures around the 50s to the 90s or so, and uh, if we're going to do prolonged um, exposure to temperatures beyond that, uh, we need shelter or clothing, we need to do something to to be able to survive along. There was some story just out with a, about a guy who survived in the ocean for 75 hours. An experienced diver, um, decided to swim to shore and then current carried him out and took them uh, days to find him, but he, he survived, but it was very close. Um, but is all life so picky? I mean, are we so, well, actually I think my kids are only happy between 70 Five and seventy-eight. Beyond that, we get whining. So, so. Uh, microorganisms are often the most adaptable, toughest examples of life on Earth. We call these extremophiles, which, believe it or not, even though this is the great catchphrase for the past couple decades, um, <coughs> the SETI folks are starting to move away from this phrase because putting life into categories like this ignores it really is a continuum and it, it kind of limits how we focus. But it was important to... 35 Kelvin? I'm sorry, I got to add you. Yeah, down to negative 398 uh, Fahrenheit. These, these little water bears can survive. So it's a tardigrade. Um, you got to, if you watch Star Trek Discovery um, on CBS All Access, you got to see a, a tardigrade that was about six, seven feet tall. So. They never really explained that, but uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, they can put in frozen oxygen. You, they can put these little guys in in a uh, vacuum of space, uh, cook them at yeah, really high temperatures. Um, there's a colony of these living on the moon now. Uh, they're part of the experiment uh, launched by India, right? And the India probe crashed on the moon, and so. Uh, there's a pile of tardigrades in the lunar soil. Uh, yay! <laughs> yeah, no, no. We contaminated another body again. Uh, uh, which, which is probably closing the barn door after the cows have gone out and pooped all over the pasture, but we do at NASA have protocols for spacecraft decontamination de de um, and trying to keep the rest of the solar system pristine. But, what we understood had to be done now is probably not even as good enough as what we'll think in the future it is nothing like what we cared about in the 70s when we launched stuff to Mars and elsewhere. So yeah, we've, it's probably now a race between the stuff we've dumped elsewhere in the solar system and whatever might have been there indigenously. The more we discover, the more we worry. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> so archaea, these are the very ancient uh, line of bacteria on Earth. Um, I still have archaea around to today. Um, these are called acidophiles in this example. They convert sulfur to sulfuric acid and that chemical reaction gives them the energy that they want. That's the breakfast of champions. Um, deep ocean vents have these little guys and volcanic vents have these guys. Sophobos, uh, I think is how you say that. There's these little guys here. They're there in a hydrothermal pool. That looks really neat. Um, with a scientist doing some studies on them. Uh, halophiles, they live in very high salt environments like the Great Salt Lake and the Dead Sea. Uh, three examples I'm just not going to pronounce. Uh, <laughs> here they are and there's where you can find them locked in otherwise what looks like non-livable conditions inside solid ice, uh, salt. Thermophiles, they like really hot environments. Geysers, hot springs, have thermal vents, volcanic vents. Yellowstone Park pools have vivid colors based on the zones of life, the different uh, species or varieties of the, these old guys. So the color actually shows you a different population of these uh, uh, archaea. Pretty cool, or pretty hot. Uh, Secrophiles are really good at very cold. So you find these deep in the ocean, in the Arctic and Antarctic ice. They can survive the crushing pressures at the bottom of a glacier or continental ice shelf. And they just uh, sit there. Uh, methanogen, or, or methanogen, are one variety here. How do they survive the crushing pressure? Do they basically, are they just a shell? It might be. And then methanogens, they like hot springs, swamps, trash dumps. The animal and human digestive system, you have methanogens in you. If you've ever burped or farted, uh, it's oh, your... Oh, that's where the methane comes yeah, from. Yeah, that's your methanogens. <laughs> so when you take uh, Beano, because you don't want to be an embarrassment to your uh, spouse, uh, you are suppressing your methanogens temporarily. Hmm. I'm also breaking up some of the bubbles that form that... So it, the gases escape less um, eruptively. <laughs> uh, so look, scary looking old guys. I don't like the stringiness there. It's like, what are you guys doing? I was so, so surprised when I found out it was flammable. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and simultaneously inflammable. So, <laughs> one of my favorite things of English language. Um, we even, even have a possible, I, I need to actually look up, I, I forgot to go back. Theory. It's an old theory that um, phosphorus uh, is one of the elements found in our DNA structure, the, the base pairs. Um, and uh, arsenic is chemically very similar, arsenate. And so theoretically, if you had a very high arsenic environment, like is found in Mono Lake, um, you could get DNA or RNA that incorporates uh, or replaces phosphorus with arsenic or ars arsenate atoms. Um, it's quite a, a tumultuous story. Uh, and many, again, whenever you have a claim of life elsewhere or difference life, you send your community jumps on, on you. Uh, if I don't remember the story clearly, but I think it was a uh, relatively new researcher, young lady, who, who put this forward. And the, she just wasn't prepared for the media storm and the scientific storm. And I think she was drummed out of the, out of, out of the scientific community. She also couldn't duplicate it, I think. She couldn't duplicate it. Uh, pretty much it fell to possible contamination in the, in the laboratory, yeah. where she was you know taking apart these these cells and getting the material out of them to test the molecular weights of the DNA and so so probably didn't happen but theoretically it could uh, we don't know if it actually has been observed um, might we find that life arose more than once 
Uh, we'd need to find something like extremophiles that ex existed temperature and pressures, chemical environments that are far from what all these everyday extremophiles do, like a big gap. There's no life in between all this we see and this ridiculously crazy environment over here. That'd be evidence of it. Uh, very different DNA or RNA construction uh, or a different information containing molecule altogether. We would love to find that. If you found on Europa or Mars uh, something that looks single cellular, and when you really figured it out, you found, well, this, the way the information of how it builds itself is encoded in a totally different structure. Wow. Um, that, that would be, maybe Nobel's all over the place. So. Uh, or a different cellular structure or survival mechanism, something that uh, is a radical departure from the tremendous varieties of things that we see now. And to date, we don't have any of those examples. So we do find single cell organisms miles down into the crust of the earth, deep underneath the ocean uh, in the crust of the earth, and up at the top of the stratosphere and beyond, all the way up into uh, basically the harshness of space. There's single cell stuff floating around up there uh, doing its thing. So life has completely dominated Earth in every possible way. There's no place you can't go, and you're not uh, surrounded by billions of little single-cell things. We're swimming in it. We are swimming in it. Um, in fact, we are intimately connected with it. Just the health of our skin, the, our, our bodies themselves uh, contain more DNA of other single-celled organisms than they do of our own cells. So if you took out every cell that's you and your DNA, there'd still be, uh, number-wise, more cells than what we took away. Mass-wise, I think it's about 10% of you or something like that. You'd still be a kind of a gray-shaped thing that looks just like you standing here without any of your cells in it. What do you call that, the bio known, a bio, bio, what is that? Yeah. Uh, Biosphere, no, not a sphere, bios. Yeah, you're, you're shoot, shooting close to it. Yeah. Some, I can't I, remember the word. Something yeah. Something like that, yeah. yeah. So we, we're, we're, it's like palm olive. We're, we're soaking in it. So, yeah, that's an old commercial reference there. Good day, Chief. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, where might we find life in our solar system we're doing fine? Um, who wants to do it? I've, I've thrown some names out, but where would you guess? If I said, you're in charge of uh, a brand new space agency, but your only job is to find life, where are you going to start sending your missions? Europa. Not oh, Europa. Enceladus. Enceladus. Yeah. Where's that one? Enceladus is around yeah. well, Saturn. Saturn. Oh, okay. It's the Saturnian system. Asteroids, maybe. Oh, asteroids, okay. Who was that one? I don't know if you saw in the Astronomy Magazine, they had the uh, article on an asteroid where they found ice and other stuff. Mm hmm. I got slides in just a second. <laughs> You're right, I got it. Well, my favorite growing up was Mars. In fact, you know, that's where we sent the Viking uh, missions and we did the first failed experiments where we scooped soil, put in a lot of it, mixed water with it and got very strange things and Carl Sagan and everybody were kind of disappointed and some scientists went, well, that's proof there's just no life there at all, period. And that became the, the story for decades. Like, nah, no, no sense looking at Mars, and we'll see why right now. You got the shoot my on there on the left side? Oh, no, these are volcanoes. Oh, volcanoes. Yeah, um, Olympus Mons is just over the horizon. These are the big three. Yeah, this is the highlands where water uh, collected with the with easterlies coming around at the equator like they would on Earth. Um, uh, you get upslope here, just like we get here for all, all of our good snowstorms. Nice and moist upslope, and then the rain flowed down and helped uh, form this. It went into the big northern ocean up here. Uh, some of this is also cracking or splitting of the crust as the planet cooled and shrank. So not all of this is caused by water flow. So, so it's geologic calamity. Uh, we talked about it back when we talked about Mars, but the Grand Canyon on Earth would be about right there. Interesting. It is the biggest canyon known in the solar system, with Olympus Mons being the biggest mountain in the solar system on a pretty small planet. 
Fourth planet from the sun, semi-similar to Earth in size and temperature, semi-similar. At the summer at noon, you can get up to about 74 degrees, so warmer than here today. Uh, uh, but average temperatures are usually about 150 below. Uh, in the winter at the poles, it gets down to 225 below Fahrenheit. Um, so definitely tilted on the cold side of the, the spectrum. Uh, ice at the poles and the soil uh, are, are seen. We know there's a lot of water in ice there. Um, there's evidence of lake rivers and rain in the past. What's the tilt? It's 24 degrees. So it's just a half degree different than us. Yeah. yeah. So, really? And it's, it's 24 degrees. And its day is 24 hours, 38 minutes long. So you have, as, as I see in my planetarium shows, you got 38 minutes more every day to brush your teeth and clean the cat box. So. Well, people naturally want longer days. So if they put people, they put them in this, this experiments. With oh, them. they drift longer. In yeah. a room and they just let them, there's no indication of time whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And it, after a little while, a month or so, people are living 28 hour days or something like that. Uh, if they're teenagers, they'd probably drift towards 35 hours. Yeah, probably. Uh, so we get dry ice, frozen carbon dioxide, and water ice at the poles. The, um, every, every spring, summer, on um, the hemisphere, the dry ice re-vaporizes, uh, going from uh, a solid to a gas, so sublimate. Um, and the atmospheric pressure of the entire planet goes up a little, uh, but the water stays put. Uh, here's morning frost formed. That's cool. Um, that, Viking that too. Picture from a different planet. That yeah, I know. That is really cool. It it looks simultaneous to me. It looks like some I see in part out in Arizona and some yeah, lava field. You get the cold morning. And yeah. The frosty or something. But then it it also has a foreign quality to it, or maybe it's the tilt. Maybe if I had some more beers, I would think it looks normal. Uh, you got river channels. Some look like they have formed from a long period of water uh, falling and creating channels that met and flowed. Some look like they've been formed more from a single violent event, like Wouldn't a flood. Wouldn't that equally be uh, caused by um, the high-speed atmosphere? Uh, no. It the flows. I mean, it's yeah. But the atmospheric pressure is a minuscule fraction. Uh, that's something that Hollywood always gets wrong, even in the greatest films, that we are big, strong Earth people. We have big, strong Earth buildings and spaceships that we would put there. And in the most violent dust storm, uh, the force on you is similar to about a one mile an hour breeze on Earth. Because we have a thick soup here, that is similar to being 10 miles higher than Mount Everest in atmospheric pressure. So it's every time than is the atmospheric pressure on the surface of Mars. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we don't care. I mean, you can put a 100 mile an hour wind blasting on you and go, eh. But they, they have evidence of dust storms? Oh yeah, well, the dust, it's easy to pick up dust. Right, right. It doesn't take a lot of atmospheric pressure to do that. So it's very, very fine dust. Without water recently, uh, you just get that stuff grinding itself down to talcum powder uh, levels without clay being formed. So, yeah. So, sorry. All of Mars movies are wrong. <laughs> they, I, 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 it's, all, it's, it's always the dramatic thing, though. You got it. Oh, no, dust storm. Well, other than ruining your visibility and getting into your, the joints of your suit, and if it gets in your lungs, it will cause, you know, I think, long term diseases like uh, uh, breathing moon dust or asbestos would. You, you don't want that stuff on you. Uh, it's not going to blow you over. It's just <laughs> the, the force is not there. Uh, so it's not enough to carve geologic things. It can make sand dunes and dust dunes. Um, a, a very contentious uh, observation are these little guys here. These come and go. And you can see, if you look down below here, what look like water oozing out of a layer on the edge of a crater here and wetting the soil as it flows down and then evaporates, leaving behind a salty material. 
That's what it looks like. That's our, our gut reaction to uh, being Earth people, expecting Earth processes to go on. Um, the pressures and the temperatures just don't work well with this idea. This stuff would have to be so high in salt that it's almost like toothpaste yeah. uh, to flow. And that's not going to flow very far in the greatly diminished gravity of Mars. Um, so I think the scientific community, from my understanding, is, is leaning towards this being uh, silt falls. So these are disturbed areas of this talcum powder-like surface. And they start to tumble in the little miniature avalanches that expose darker material. And then eventually that gets covered over again. And you can see that lighter material collecting down here. But there's still some planetary scientists are going, no, 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 this is water, this is oozing water coming out. Um, and the Italians, right, but their word canali. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> you got canals on Mars. Yeah. Not carbon dioxide, no. The pressure is way too low. Yeah, you, you go straight, you got deposition in the uh, fall and winter, so it goes through straight from gas to solid. Um, it's just what happens in your freezer at home with the water vapor that gets in when you reach for your ice cream bar and close it, and then it goes straight to frost all over everything uh, inside. So the atmosphere yeah. itself does that here. There's a great science fiction uh, story, I can't remember what. Uh, it's, it occurs in the distant future where uh, engineers and scientists have moved the Earth away from the sun to preserve the planet as the uh, Earth, as the sun keeps heating. And it goes through its red giant phase, puffing off atmosphere. They've moved Earth out and out and out. And then the sun starts to very rapidly on, on a geologic time scale or astronomical time scale, cools down and Earth starts getting really cold fast, and society just can't pay, the human race can't pay the, the price to move us back in fast enough to keep the planet warm. And so temperatures are dropping and people are starting to live into the, into the Earth underground, and they have the problem of the oxygen and nitrogen snow at night uh, as, the, as the atmosphere does the same thing here on Earth. And so people go up in special, super heavy mechanized suits to go out on the surface and, and collect things or look for materials in the snow of, of the atmosphere itself freezing around them. It, it was a really great imagery. I don't remember. Yeah, pretty, pretty nasty. So. so that's happening on Mars now with its main atmospheric constituent. But another problem, and this is what showed up in the Viking uh, results, are, I mentioned these last night, the uh, peroxides and um, Percolates. So these are uh, peroxides like hydrogen peroxide form and stay stable. Uh, in, in our hot, wet world, hydrogen peroxide is pretty unstable. You pour it on your skin and it bubbles away and you get water and, and the hydrogen gets released. And pro hydrogen peroxide is two oxygens, two hydrogens, and the oxygen comes out, not the hydrogen. The oxygen comes out, leaving water. Um, <clears throat> so kills kills bugs. And so if you have... Um, single cell organisms on the surface, it's going to kill bugs there too, presumably. Uh, percolates are similar, they're very reactive uh, chemicals uh, involving chlorine, oxygen, and carbon. Um, there are also iron oxides, that rusty look, the red look of Mars itself is because it has a higher iron um, content in the, in the min minerals. We see that in places like the Red Earth of Oklahoma, Red Earth Society. You have the mountains and cliffs around Sedona that make it a cosmic uh, uh, new age hotspot. Uh, uh, and you also lack a strong magnetic field to shield uh, solar winds from the sun. You don't have an ozone layer because uh, you don't have free oxygen. And so you get ultraviolet radiation from the sun beating down onto the surface too. So it's a very harsh surface environment for life as we understand it. You got chemical and radiation uh, and extreme temperature reasons that life can't hold together. 
But under the surface, uh, under, uh, it's a song from Little Mermaid, Under the Sea, life is better down where it's wetter, take it from me. Um, it is feasible that if macro life could have gotten started at some point, that it, just like here, we've got living stuff miles down into the earth. Um, you might have it miles down into the crust of Mars, just waiting to be discovered. And that goes to last night's thing. I think I have the, I, I don't think I have it in it. They have in Gale Crater Curiosity uh, mission going on. It's been sampling the atmosphere there for six years. And they see a spring and summertime release of methane and oxygen that so far is very difficult to explain using geochemistry. So is it life? Is it little microbes waking up going, yay, get, let us have a meal? I don't, I don't know. And, and we don't know yet. This is the rock I was talking about earlier. Uh, this is uh, ALH. I was totally wrong with the number. Uh, 84001 comma zero. It's just a designation of, of how they keep track, catalog the rocks that they get in Antarctica. Uh, and these little microbes are smaller than Earth microbes by a hundred times. So it's a normal human, 0.7 inches tall. There they are. This is what the electron microscope shows. That's what the researchers put forward, at least, it could be um, mineralized bacteria inside this Martian rock picked up on Earth. I knew they were microscopes. I didn't know it was an electron microscope. It's an electron microscope. You gotta go really small yeah, to, to see these little guys. We do see gypsum deposits on Mars. This is from Opportunity. It's near the rim of Endeavour Crater. This is yeah, gypsum forms in the presence of water flowing through soil. So definitely a long-term uh, liquid water process is needed for gypsum to, to be uh, found. Calcium chain water comes in, contacts with sulfides and rocks, and mixed with volcanic activity to do that. So, yeah. So, yeah, you're right. You're ready to start your uh, drywall business on, on Mars. You don't, you don't have to ship it there. So, uh, Curiosity landed uh, in 2012, size of a small car. You had the crane landing method that worked. There's the um, par parachute and the mission uh, as it was landing. That's the thing, looks like it's about the size of a with a PT cruiser, is that right? Uh, here's how it came in with a sky hook method lowered. There's its first image of its foot and the soil. Uh, dust on, from another camera looking just, just this is one of the cameras just making sure everything is okay where it landed. Um, this is a self picture. It's an actual picture of it in place. It's not an artist picture. You can see it's taking a picture and then it's taking a pic picture knitted together at different angles, like a panorama, and its shadow of the boom is there, but kind of edited it out. So it's kind of a little camera trickery to remove the arm that's taking the picture of itself. Um, so it's got a bunch of instruments looking at soil samples. It's drilling into the actual uh, material and pulling stuff out because you're trying to get below the self-sterilizing surface to see if there's something down below. Um, they have uh, seen organic molecules uh, preserved in clay uh, with a 3.5 billion year uh, mark. So this is material that probably existed in an ancient lake. Um, we just don't know. Evidence for life still not done. It's rich in sulfur, which helped preserve it. Um, if, it, if it's the remains of biological life, it's similar to what we find on Earth, uh, a kerogen. These are materials found in meteorites too, so it's not necessarily stuff that came from life itself. Um, and it'll keep going, keep drilling and looking for more of this stuff. Uh, kerogen is a solid organic material, sedimentary rocks. Uh, it's about 10 to the 16 tons of carbon on Earth. Um, I was going to say this earlier, we, we share similar carbon levels as uh, Venus has, uh, but here the carbon is in forms like kerogen and limestone. So if you take all the limestone locked up in the soil made by water, made oceans and precipitates and, and like that and then carried uh, along by continental movement, 
take all that and vaporize it, we'd be very similar to Venus with a crushing atmosphere of pressures at the surface, uh, uh, like going a mile down into the ocean here. So, yeah, we, we are similar, similar, but we remain cold, we had oceans, and the carbon got locked up in, into these other processes. So here's Gale Crater, and this is the area that started exploring. I think its goal is to climb to the top of this thing. So it's working towards climbing the central peak. They want to get as much science done early, um, and then as it goes up through the strata here, um, you, if some calamity happens or just rolls, you, you yeah. Why would you choose to look at a crater where you obviously have an impact mm -hmm. on a foreign body that severely disrupted the surrounding geology? Because we see evidence that this uh, flooded, that the impact occurred earlier than the water arrival. So it made for a, a nice self-contained water body. You can see how smooth it is in here. And so it made an area where you would expect seasonal depositions of material making sedimentary layers. It would bring organic material in from other locations around and embed that in layers and like that. Yeah. So that's, that's the, the thinking, is that you, you're getting, uh, getting you, you get a lot more bang for the buck traveling a small distance and going through a lot of time. Rather than out here, where like, okay, it's the same, 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 same <laughs> geologically. There's a tracks of uh, its wheels coming over the sand dune, or the powder dune, <laughs> towards where it currently is. I mean, that, that doesn't look like New Mexico back there to you. <laughs> um, we have vein, mineral veins, probably formed by water interactions with soil. This, this looks like... Um, I think it's a gypsum again, or maybe, I'm not sure. Uh, we do seasonal atmospheric methane, I've already talked about that. On Earth, the main methane producers are termites and uh, gut, bovine gut bacteria. And you guys, eating beans at a Mexican restaurant from last night. <laughs> uh, so coming to the rescue, European Space Agency's trace gas orbiter is in place and it's looking at the regions that methane is released and creating time-lapse movies of how it evolves. Methane breaks down pretty quickly in the ultraviolet light beating down on the uh, planet every day. So it... Uh, what does it break down to? Uh, methane is CH4, so it's carbon dioxide and hydrogen. Yeah. Okay. More of what the atmosphere is already made of. Yeah. So there's methane abundances, high is red, kind of intuitively, and this is what it looks like. You have hydrated minerals here, subsurface hydrogen here, volatile rich substrate of some kind. We're trying to piece it together. I just say, send an armada of life sampling robots out there now, and just <laughs> yeah, quit, quit, yeah, quit, quit this long, this is a longer build up than it took to get to end game in the MCU. So. We don't have to change the temperature of it. We can just send plants. No, no, no <laughs> send plants. No. Now that is a big argument, though. The ethics of, you know, we're, we're studying it. We're looking for life. We're figuring things out here. But at what point do we pull the trigger and just say send people? Because as soon as, you know, we probably have contaminated a few spots with the landers we've already had because we didn't clean things well enough. I'm sure. But when the first person comes, you're bringing poop bags and skin flakes and dropping hairs and, and all sorts of bodily excretions, and that's going to make it out of suits. It's going to make it out of the, the capsule you're living in or any, any building you live on. When we go, it's, it's over, kind of. Right? So when do you do that? When, when should, should you ethically have an ultra-environmental movement say, don't go to Mars, stop, or you go, hey, this is just, this is another planet, and humans need more space eventually. You're worried about the Native American Indians. No, well, that's the problem. I, now, you're not going to displace, as far as you know, sentient life here, but we're definitely going to displace whatever life is there, and if there is, and we will eventually swamp it completely. Well, we'll turn it all to our chirality of right-handed and left-handed sugars and amino acids. Um, there's a, another self-portrait 
in Gale Crater. Again, it's a panorama where they've edited out the, the oh, boom arm. Yeah, and that's just incredible. Mount Sharp here. It just you can see the strata layers here. It looks like the Middle East. It really does. I mean, Oh, okay. So this is from last night. So I didn't, I didn't get time to put this in. That's crazy. So here are the percolates, uh, uh, the mixture of calcium, carbon, and ions of oxygen or magnesium uh, and ionized carbon and oxygen. All right. So let's go on. You, you mentioned asteroids as a place. So there we go. Ceres is another place we can look for life. Um, it has mystery white spots with albedos that are almost near 100%. I mean, these are, this is like baby powder uh, sitting down on the bottom here, or maybe salt, salts or snow of some kind. We don't know exactly for sure what those are. You can see this other coloration around here. So if this, if this bluish material is just a thin version of what's built in there, yeah, that might give us a clue. But uh, it's the largest asteroid belt member. It's 25% water. It itself contains a quarter mass of the entire rest of the asteroid belt. Another thing that Hollywood always gets wrong, since we're in the asteroid belt, is if you're flying to the asteroid belt, there's giant rocks rolling around, bouncing off each other all the time. You've got this vast belt of an orbit much larger than Mars's orbit, in which you have you know, just this little rock here, pretty small, much, much smaller than our moon, has a quarter of the mass of everything else that's out there. If you're standing on one particle, of asteroid belt material and looking around with your eyes, you would not see anything else. Maybe if you had a telescope and knew where to look, you could find other asteroid belt members that direction and that direction or up there or something, but it's just not what Hollywood shows you. So anyways, off my soapbox. Um, I would. Don't kick, don't push down. That's right, don't move at all. Oh, I had a leg tremor, and now I'm, 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 I've achieved escape velocity. I spaz. <laughs> yes. Uh, this could halt, uh, house the salty ocean beneath this crust. Um, it may have been much warmer in the past. It may have had a different orbit, been closer. Uh, so there's, if we ever just are in the neighborhood, it'd be worth at least looking into the subsurface material to see if there's ancient or still living extremophiles. <laughs> Yeah. So it could be like a, the dried material from a geyser. Yeah. Epsom salt. Epsom salt. Yeah. They didn't mention Epsom salt. Yeah. It's another material they found there. So we can find minerals in other places, but like you said, when we when we actually make that leap of going to someplace else, whoever decides to actually go won't be swimming in it anymore. Mm -hmm. You have to take that little bubble with them. <laughs> I don't know, it's pretty risky. I think we did, oh, what, what mission was it? It was, we, it's a, it was the first use of aerogel. We went out into the environment of a comet. Mm -hmm. oh, it's just not coming to me. I even visited the lab and, uh, and saw them looking at the samples through a big oh, window. Roughly? Early early two thousands. Okay. Okay. Now, aerogel is a very very low density material that they expose to space as it goes along. You get little particles and little molecules and stuff trapped in it. Right. You bring it back to Earth and you get down inside and whatever it's captured has been decelerated gently enough that it should still have its original structure from space. And I think the the space craft returning crashed. Right. Yeah, and the, yeah. I just don't remember the name at all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and so they, that, the problem of contamination then becomes an issue. But they were still doing their best to get as much science out of it. It's blank. I don't have it. Um, so we can go out to Jupiter's moons, Isle Europa and others. Europa, big ice ball here. This is all icy crust with cracks from uh, Basically, you can think of this as a giant ice flow with icebergs all jammed together. 
This coloration is largely sulfur compounds uh, belched out by the innermost moon, Io. So Io is, uh, is tainting Europa, or I like to picture it as like sprinkling fish food up on the surface of, <laughs> of the tank. So we'll see. Um, third largest moon, frozen surface of nearly pure water. Uh, it, it has a non-circular orbit around um, Jupiter, and Jupiter being the gravitational giant in the uh, solar system, not counting the sun, um, is, has a tremendous amount of tidal squeezing of its rocky core. So there's a lot of energy uh, being <coughs> generated or converted inside the moon, probably keeping the inner uh, parts of Europa liquefied. So you've got a huge moon-sized ocean layer down there with a disequilibrium in materials, materials coming down from above if it can make it through the ice in any way, and a disequilibrium of, of heat. <coughs> so there's a hypothetical cross-section slice out of <coughs> Europa here, a rocky core, some other maybe dense material, maybe uh, compressed ices of a different material. Then you've got your liquid layer where the pressure is low enough that it can be liquid, then you're back to cold enough to be solid again. I, not really known. Um, how do you get through this crust layer? Uh, more recently, we have found geyser-like activity. So if that's the case, all we have to do is fly close to the surface and just sample and come around again, sample and come around again. Um, before we knew that, there was actually talk about dropping nuclear bombs onto the surface to punch a hole through so we could get some of the gooey interior out to test. A nuclear bomb or yeah. a nuclear powered heater core? No, blast the Crack the egg. Blast, blast, blast a chunk. Yeah. Look at yeah, yeah, use it. Well, other people said let's be more gentle, but yeah, nuclear powered heater to to do it. But you're talking miles, not hundreds of miles of ice. That's it's tough enough here on Earth. It took I don't know how many years it take the uh, Russians to get through yeah ice cap down to the subsurface lake of, in Antarctica. Uh, they too probably release things that have not been around for millions of years. No, oh, that's good for it. It's good for it. <laughs> yeah, it builds. So there's the the uh, geysers on Europa. So. Didn't Cassini fly through there, or not Cassini, but Juno? Would you look at that? Going through that? Yeah, but I don't. Juno sampled. Did it actually have the equipment though to sample it? Okay. And this is this is a uh, composite of. Uh, different material, um, I did different observations, got a visible picture, and this is, I think, radio uh, signatures of water release. Mm. Mm. Io is the pizza planet. Mm. Town here. Yeah, we got volcanoes, volcanoes, volcanoes. Io is the closest, it also has a non circular orbit and it is heated to the point of being molten throughout and it's got volcanoes everywhere always erupting so you have a uh, actually have a, a thin sulfur uh, dioxide atmosphere so it would stink to visit there stinky pizza planet uh, but it has the chemistry useful for life uh, it's hot to warm location so it's got lots of the hydrothermal concept going uh, but tremendous amounts of radiation. It's inside of one of the stronger radiation belts of Jupiter. Um, we have to super harden spacecraft to go through, and even Juno, I think, only swoops in briefly and goes out, takes a rest from the radiation. It is, uh, I think, uh, human beings going into this area using our best spacecraft shielding only the last minutes before you're just kind of cooked inside by radiation. Uh, very violent volcanic environment. And there's very little water. It's trapped in other minerals and stuff. So pretty hostile, not impossible to find something uh, alive, but a uh, pretty nasty place. The other moons are further out, right? And they're inside the Jupiter's magnetosphere, mm -hmm. which we are protecting from solar radiation. Correct. And the further out you get, you're not in that super nasty inner belt. Yeah. Like Ganymede. 
So Ganymede here has its own magnetic field, enough that it actually has aurora. So that's pictured there. Our largest moon in the solar system. It's the only one to have its own significant magnetic field that's shielded from the solar wind. Uh, so just what you're saying. Uh, <clears throat> there's ice and liquid water layers and a lot less radiation from Jupiter. So a little more quieter environment. Uh, probably a good place to, to, to check. I, would, I think it's a real picture, but I'm guessing this has been added artistically. Yeah. It's probably a composite picture with artistic uh, aurora. Yeah. Uh, I got four minutes to go. We could touch a little bit into the Saturn system. So, Saturn system, pretty planet, uh, Enceladus or enchiladas, whichever where you want to pronounce it. Enchiladas of the moon. Uh, again, pure white uh, water crust surface. This one has evidence of a lot of flow and, and sort of tectonic uh, action, a lot of crevices and cracks, newer material making it out to the surface. Got an older material uh, surface here that isn't being disrupted as much because you have cratering. And here the cratering has all been erased. Um, so this is much newer surface, so it's being regenerated, recycled, uh, sort of a, very similar to what's happening on Earth, the reason we don't have Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sixth largest moon of Saturn, 99% water ice at the surface. The Cassini probe detected carbon, hydrogen, nit nitrogen, oxygen. Molten core giving rise to good nutrient flow, good temperatures at some depth. Uh, much, even much more extensive uh, geysers occurring out of what are called the tiger uh, stripes. Uh, just a bunch of cracks in the ice. Uh, this would be the place to go and fly through and just pick up uh, freeze dried single cell organisms uh, or space amoeba. <clears throat> There's another picture of the geysers. Just amazing. Yeah, that's cool. Those are real pictures. Those are real, yeah. I yeah. love that stuff. That's so cool. Right. Here's Titan. This is the largest moon of the Saturn system. It has a pure nitrogen, a nearly pure nitrogen atmosphere with a surface pressure higher than the surface pressure here on, on Earth in our oxygen-nitrogen mixture. Uh, it's cold, very cold. It has a photochemical haze around it. I'm kind of harkening back to the earlier part of the course here, uh, in which it has a reverse greenhouse effect. It actually lets light come on in, but it doesn't let infrared, uh, I'm sorry, it, it blocks light coming in and it lets infrared out very easily. I, I, didn't, I did a normal thing. So, so it gets colder than it should be in this part of the solar system to the point that methane is at the triple point. So you have liquid methane pools and ponds and oceans. You have methane clouds and methane rain. I see prints sing about that. Um, so there's the moon right there, pretty amazing. Uh, largest moon of Saturn, thick in organic compounds, nitrogen, atmosphere, methane, rain, snow, and vapor. Uh, half again more pressure than the Earth at sea level. Very cold, about 292 degrees down. Uh, oh, organic compounds? Yes. Organic? Methane. Organic. Oh, okay. yep. Methane is organic, I yep. suppose. And the Huygens probe went down, taking pictures as it went down and landed. Uh, this mountain range here, 1,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,
So we see seasonal variations of stuff. It's just a, it's an organic compound rich, brutally cold foreign environment. But does that mean something lifelike may not come about? Like we, Lake Ontario there. Lake Ontario? Yeah. <laughs> and there may be life there, but as of now we can't go there. Uh, no. <laughs> And because temperatures are so low, it may be a very, very slow reacting life. I mean, you yeah. may have stuff, you know, takes years thousand years uh, for one, one cell to divide into two or something. We don't know. I mean, it's just total, complete speculation of how that looked, what they'd be built on. I and mean, is there something equivalent to lipids, carbohydrates, and proteins? Who knows? Um, so we'll end with this. If you were given that $10 billion, now where'd you go? Mars, Europa, Io, Ganymede, Ceres, Ensalada, Enceladus. <laughs> I'd go to <laughs> I'll tell you. <laughs> well, that's kind of boring. Yeah, no, that was... That's called being a biologist. <laughs> <laughs> What's your pick? I'll Mars and Enceladus. Mars and Enceladus. I'd pick you want to go there? I think I would, I'd choose Europa, personally, just because the monolith went there in 2001, and we were told not to, not to ever touch the people there. So. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Good place to stop. Yeah, we'll pick up next time to a wider definition of life zones, and we'll go into actual planets and beyond. So. Yeah. Because either one is possible yeah. and they're both scary. Well, yeah. we'll talk about Stephen Hawking later. Cause quantum, quantum mechanics, anything could pop up at any time, anywhere. No. <laughs> yeah. only, if you have, only if you have the app. <laughs> the app, the app. <laughs> I was minding my own.